I think you might recognize my friend Jackson from a collab that we did a few months back. We actually last time did a video about book only moments in the Harry Potter series that did not make it into the movies and you guys have been leaving so many great <laughs> comments that we thought that we would do a part two. You could also call it year two or chamber of secrets. Well that implies that we'll have to do this seven times. <laughs> oh, didn't think about Maybe that. Maybe we will. <laughs> There's enough material for sure. During this video we're going to bring up some of the things that we forgot about last time and also some of the things that you guys suggested in the comments because there were so many good moments. Every time I read through those comments, I'm just like laughing and excited. <laughs> I want to like go back and reread the books again. So thank you guys for participating and again, leave your favorite book only moments in the comments because that was I think one of my favorite parts of the last video. Oh yeah, totally. So before we get started, we have the same two disclaimers that we had last time. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, if you've not read the Harry Potter books, uh, we're gonna talk about things that happen in the Harry Potter books, and if you don't wanna hear those, maybe you could watch the video that we made for Jackson's channel. We did another collab over there, but we'll tell you more about that at the end of the video. And the other disclaimer is we understand that the movies cannot be exactly the same as the books, so this is less of a complaint and more of a video about things that we love about the books that you just can't get from the movies. Yo, so where do you wanna start? A bunch of people commented generally about Harry's sass. Yes. Sassy Harry in the books. <laughs> and all the different things that he said that were amazing. He's just so funny in the books. He's oh, yeah. just really quick, really witty. Super quick witted. Personal favorite, there's no need to call me sir, professor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that shows how like totally anti-authoritarian he is, which rocks. So great. And he just has no fear when it comes to stuff like that, yeah. which is really impressive. Oh yeah. Then why is Runal Wazlu written inside the front cover? Harry's heart skipped a beat. It's my nickname. <laughs> That one kills me every time. <laughs> Overall, what I love about the books is like the sense of humor and like the tone. And I think a lot of that really comes out with like Harry's quick wittedness. I think when I've recommended the books to people too, which sounds so weird that there are like people who haven't read them, but when they do finally read them, that's the first thing they always tell me is like, whoa, I didn't realize these books were so funny. I think a lot of people miss them when they were younger. They don't even realize how much they would really appeal to them as an adult. Yeah. And so reminding them that there's a lot of substance there and also that they are just hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> that comes up with me a lot too. Yeah, I mean J.K. Rowling is so funny just in yeah. herself. She's a very funny person. In general, a lot of the characters lost their humor, like Ron. Ron's oh, yeah. so funny in the books. Professor McGonagall too is really funny and really just such a badass. Oh yeah. Have a biscuit, Potter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that one was also, like, it's funny when we talk about it now, but when you read it in the book, it's just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite things is in, I think it's in Chamber of Secrets, and Harry had given the Dursley's home phone number to Ron, and Ron tries calling him, and he's, like, shouting. It's, like, in all caps italicized, as if he's, like, yelling from the other end of a football field, I think it says, and it's just, like, he had no idea. He doesn't understand how phones work, so he's just shouting so loud. It's also funny because it's not something that Harry even realize that there are people that don't understand what a phone is and <laughs> yes. don't use it on a regular basis. So he didn't realize when he was giving Ron his phone number that there would be this confusion. <laughs> and he probably also was just excited to like have a friend to give his phone number to. Oh, probably, probably had never had that yeah. before. Oh. Or, or. <laughs> also, as I said this, I realized that took place in 1992, historically, but so weird to think now that, like, they had a landline. Now it would just be, Dursley's never gave him a cell phone. He wouldn't have yeah. had. Yeah, it's interesting to think about. One that I noticed that a lot of you guys brought up in the comments was Harry and Ginny's relationship and the development of that relationship, <laughs> which was severely lacking in the movie. Yeah, I feel like just especially remember in book five when they were staying at Grimald Place and how like that was when you really realized like, whoa, when did Ginny start kicking so much ass? Like she is so cool with her like that bogey hex. She like clearly expressed she was over Harry or at least had matured to the point where like she wasn't you know, kind of obsessed with him as a celebrity and wasn't super crushing on him, like, she had moved on. I think Harry remarked, like, wow, like, when did Ginny become so confident or something? And Hermione was like, when she realized she, like, was over you. Aww. <laughs> it was, like, great. I loved that moment. So there's this really great moment where Harry's talking about how hard it was and how scary it was to have Voldemort take over his body and use it and how nobody understands what that could feel like. And Ginny kind of scolds him and reminds him that that happened to her. 
when she was really young. He totally forgot and he wrote her off and I think after that moment he probably realized how much more he had in common with her. That moment was like so powerful just because it was her like super being like check your privilege and yeah. also like really you're saying that to me? Like you don't even remember this? He probably remembers that he saved her life but doesn't remember like what her experience was. You know sharing that trauma and like no one else can know what the two of them experienced I think is a, a big part of like why they were together and like why they worked. They can understand each other on a level that nobody else can. And yeah. I think in the books it was really quite a bit more complex and beautiful. In the books Ginny is possibly my favorite character, yeah. and in the movies I forget that she's there at all. <laughs> she isn't so, really there. Her. Yeah. <laughs> Growing up with Fred and George, you start to learn that anything's possible if you've got enough nerve. Really oh. great, really great Ginny Weasley quote. A whole bunch of you guys pointed out the uh, great little conversation where Ginny's joking about Harry's tattoos. <laughs> What was it, like a roaring tiger or something it's across like his chest? It's like a Hungarian horntail, I think. Oh, wow, even, <laughs> even better. Another thing that I always liked at the end of the books is they always ended with like Harry getting picked up at Platform 9 and 3 quarters. The Dursleys were always there, the Weasleys would be there. There's that one year that Mad-Eye Moody and like Remus and stuff were there and they like threatened the Dursleys <laughs> that like you better be nice to him. Would have loved to actually physically see the look on the faces of the Dursleys when they are hanging out on this platform with with all these wizards <laughs> yeah waiting for this train to come in and clearly not fitting in and not even really wanting to be there but the fact that they did go every year to pick yeah. up it's kind of hard to believe <laughs> yes yeah. I feel like they could have just as easily just said figure out your own way home dude mm -hmm. Yeah. We're not going down there. <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of really good Luna Love Good moments that you guys suggested in the comments and she's my favorite character, so I was really happy to relive a whole bunch of those. Specifically, her giving Quidditch commentary. Ah. <laughs> oh man. Just like pointing out the shape of the clouds and not having any clue what the names of the players are and just making up new names for them. I just love there's like a line about how Harry's thinking, there's no way they would let Luna commentate a Quidditch match and then he sees McGonagall and it looks like she's kind of regretting her decision. <laughs> a lot of people brought up the artwork that Luna had in her bedroom. Yes, she painted all of her friends' faces on mm -hmm. her ceiling and then wrote the word friends over and over again, kind of intertwining them all together. In the series, Luna seems to really tiptoe around the idea that these are her friends because mm -hmm. people don't really understand her. She never really had people that she could truly call friends until Harry and Hermione and Ron and Ginny and Neville and so I don't think they ever realized how important their friendship was to Luna until they were in her room and they saw that she had painted them in this beautiful mural. Luna is so wonderful. <laughs> the more Luna, the better as, as far as I'm concerned. I love all those little moments. Maybe we'll get some Luna in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> I hope we do. One thing that I loved was in Goblet of Fire, Dudley's like school had put him on a diet, which let's not even talk about how problematic Ooh. that is. But so Harry, like since the whole family had to like follow these eating restrictions, Harry didn't have like any food to eat. So the Weasleys and Hermione, and I think even Hagrid like sent him all this food <laughs> and he was like hiding it under the floorboard of his bedroom. I just loved that. I, and I loved like reading the different things that each of them sent him to like Hermione's parents parents, or like she just sent him a bunch of sugar-free snacks because her Cause parents are nice. dentists. <laughs> and Hagrid sent his awful rock cakes, and then Mrs. Weasley just sent like everything. Just made so That's much food. <laughs> sweet. I'm so glad that Harry found people to care about him yeah. when he was away at yeah, school no because he just did not have that at all at home. Did I ever tell you my parents are dentists? Yes! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always forget about that too. It's kind of a weird thing that Harry Potter fans love to hear. It's like, Wait a second, so you're like a real life Hermione. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that a lot of people mentioned was Winky. Yes! Winky's story was dark. <laughs> Dobby always trying to cheer her up. Just Man. making it worse for her, yep. really. Just yep. he's not helping. <laughs> no, but so earnest. Oh. I love Winky, I love her storyline, and I also just love getting to see the whole structure of like house elves and like hanging out in the kitchens at Hogwarts. In general, I think they couldn't really do a whole lot with the house elves in the movies no. because they were so expensive to animate, Yeah, which makes sense. So they only kept them in when they were absolutely necessary to the main plot. Oh man, another thing that I loved was when Harry was like hanging out with Florian Fortescue and getting free ice creams. 
all the time and like Florian Fortescue was like helping him with his homework. I don't know, I just loved that. It just sounds like so fun at that age to like, that's just all you're doing. Free ice cream, I so loved great. that bit. <laughs> A lot of you guys actually brought up in the comments the fight between Harry and Lupin during book seven where Lupin has left his family and abandoned them and Harry basically brings up the fact that he grew up without his parents and that for Lupin to do that on purpose to his child is just horrible. That was so hard to read. One, because like they were fighting and then you kind of understood like why Harry was doing it. Seeing Remus Lupin who like, you know, you, was always presented to us as like such an upstanding guy and like such a good person and to have that moment of like such a low for him was like really hard to read. The fact that Harry felt grown up and confident enough to point out to Lupin that he had made a mistake. This is somebody that Harry mm -hmm. has looked up to for a long time. He's like a father figure to Harry. Yeah. So for Harry to say to Lupin that he had made a huge mistake and he needs to really rethink this and go back to his family, probably a really hard thing for Harry to do. Yeah. Um, I know Harry had to do a lot of hard things yeah. in, in Deathly yeah, Hallows, sure. understatement, but I actually kind of thought that showed the most maturity of yeah. anything that he did in Deathly Hallows was being able to do that. It's one thing to stand up to your enemies, but entirely another to stand up to your friends. Oh, that was... Yeah. We learn a lot of things from these books. <laughs> You're really good at just dropping the quotes. <laughs> I don't know if that was the exact wording. Quite regularly in the books especially, you see these themes kind of coming up again and again. It really kind of is beautiful the way that they're illustrated time and time again as these kids grow up and as you see this story from beginning to end. So the last one we're gonna talk about for this episode anyway is Fred and George yeah. and specifically <laughs> their exit from Hogwarts oh, yeah. and the swamp. There were a lot of cool fireworks and things like that in the movie, but in the books, they turned a big section of the school into a giant swamp. Yes. Just for fun. <laughs> Mostly so that, that people would have to clean it up afterwards. Yeah, and wasn't it like all the professors pretended not to know how and like Umbridge couldn't figure it out either? <laughs> I think that all the other teachers also were secretly kind of impressed by this piece of magic. Like they're wondering, did we teach them how to do it? <laughs> How did they figure this out? <laughs> and then of course the really great line, give her hell from us peeves, yeah. which couldn't be in the movies because there's no peeves. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember reading that and just being like, that was great and I know it's not gonna be in the movies because Peeves isn't in the movies. Yeah. <laughs> but one more great Fred and George moment. Yes. When Ron got his prefect badge and Mrs. Weasley's so excited and she says, well, that's everyone in the family. <laughs> and Fred says, what are George and I next door neighbors? <laughs> Never mind the fact that like Ginny wasn't even old enough to yeah. be a prefect yet, so okay. I can't have enough Fred and George. They're awesome. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all we can really talk about for this episode. Just like last time, I would love to hear in the comments if you guys have any really great book-only moments in the Harry Potter series that you wish had been in the movies, or even that you just really love to see when you go back and reread them. Yeah, apparently now we have to make seven of these videos, so <laughs> please leave us some some topics in the comments. <laughs> and just so you know, we also made a collab video over on Jackson's channel. We made a video about how people's perceptions of your sexuality can affect you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna link to the video down in the description below. Make sure you go over and watch that if that sounds like something you'd like to see. Definitely check out the rest of Jackson's videos while you're over on his channel, because his channel is great. It's one of my favorite YouTube channels ever. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.